So today we're very happy to have uh, Michele Oru, who's going to talk about the insecurity of RIs. And yeah, the stage is yours. Hi, hello. Um, my name is Michele. I, I am a researcher at Berkeley, and I wanted to talk about um, a cryptographic assumption called ROS. And um, um, generally, the, in cryptography, the way that we develop um, or assess the security of a protocol is uh, through formal arguments that say, well, if you break my cryptographic protocol, then um, you also broke this uh, long-standing mathematical problem, right? And um, this long-standing mathematical problem in our case was ROS. And breaking it allowed us to uh, find attacks in a lot of constructions that have been proposed in the past 20 years, okay? So uh, this talk is about cryptanalysis, about analyzing cryptographic assumptions. And for this reason, we might have sold as well as our paper as um, in, on the security of some blind signatures, because Schnorr signatures, Schnorr blind signatures and Okamoto Schnorr blind signatures are affected by it. Multi-signatures such as COSI and the Churon version of MUSIC, which was like one of the proposals for Bitcoin, um, they are also affected. Uh, threshold signatures, such as GJKR and the original version of Frost, which is right now with some edits in standardization in the IATF, um, Brands cache system, and uh, Microsoft Research Anonymous Credential Light. So all this protocol will follow the sort of the same template and the same ideas. Um, and uh, in particular, when uh, um, we bring these protocols, um, to hinge on a specific cryptographic assumption, namely ROS, when we analyze multiple sessions that happen in parallel, um, which is also the case generally on the internet, um, then we can find attacks. So this is sort of the context. And um, um, I wasn't sure like how was the audience, but like the talk will be structured in two big blocks. Uh, one is sort of about the theoretical uh, attack on the assumption, and it's sort of like, uh, we're gonna talk only about hash functions. And then later in the second part, I'm gonna explain how to apply to Schnorr blind signatures, which is sort of the simplest case of these ones. And, um, and from there, we will see how, how to go. Um, so ROS stands for random inhomogeneities in an overdetermined solvable system of linear equation. Don't look at this definition. Uh, the problem is uh, that we're the, the cryptographic assumption. What we believe is hard is the following. Um, I give you a prime P and I give you a number L. You have to find a bunch of vectors, a vector of length L and L plus one vectors again of length L, such that the inner product of each of these vectors with this vector of coefficient c lands in the image of the hash function. The image of what? The vector itself. Let me say this again, but in matrix notation. We have to find the, I, we are giving the adversary a field p of size p and the number l. The adversary has to build a matrix, this big matrix in the middle that has L columns and L plus one rows. Oops. And, um, and a vector of length L such that the product matrix times vector will land in the hash function image. The image of what? The hash of each of the rows of this matrix. Okay, so I give you P, I give you L, find the matrix and the vector such that the product matrix times vector is uh, equal to the hash of each of the rows of the matrix. This is the ROS problem. And we will see how this applies in, uh, in like real world cryptographic protocols later. Um, now, first thing I want to note that there are some very trivial partial solutions to this problem. For instance, if I decide to set the first, the first like L rows to be the rows of the identity matrix. So say we put the diagonal matrix with all ones here. And uh, I'm not saying anything about the last row for now. If I consider this matrix over here on the top 
and as coefficients, I fix the hash of these rows. Now it is trivial to see that the product of this matrix times this vector over here will be exactly the hash of the rows because it, the only coefficient that is going to survive in this inner product is the ith coefficient, which was said to be the hash of the ith row. Easy peasy, no? Um, now, the, I'm, again, the difficult part uh, and, and sort of really what makes this problem hard is finding the last coefficient over here, the last uh, element, which phrased in another way is about finding a linear combination of hash images such that it lands again in the hash image. We need to find a linear combination of the hash of 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, et cetera, 0, 0, 1, and so on. We have to find a non-trivial linear combination of these vectors that will still land in the, in the image of the hash function. This is sort of what made ROS hard. And so far, the best known attack that we had was called Wagner generalized birthday attack. Um, I also want to note that there is nothing special about picking the diagonal, the, the, uh, the identity metrics. You know, I could as well have picked any diagonal metrics and uh, sort of rebalance the factor in the coefficient itself. For instance, if I were to put two, I would just use as coefficients the hash of, of two and then all zeros, and then like divide it by the, by the constant two. And, um, and I will still be able to find valid partial solutions to this problem. So we have a lot of trivial solutions. The only thing that is hard is finding this non-trivial one. And Wagner found a solution to this problem, had a solution for this problem. And um, with a sort of much more general attack called the generalized Berthe attack, um, it works as follows. Um, imagine that you have a hash function and uh, you want to find um, elements um, or you want to find hash function image that XOR to zero. So the way that you would do it is it would fill many lists all of them with random elements that are obtained from the um, from the hash function. So I don't know, in the first one, I would hash zero concatenated with zero. In the second one, zero concatenated with one. The third one, zero concatenated with two, et cetera. And I would fill the list with random element. And he developed an algorithm in such a way that, that would allow us to find um, elements in each of these lists, which are probably different, such that they all sort to zero. And with a small leap of faith, and this is also written more in detail in the paper, we can find them in, uh, if we can find these elements such that they add modulo p to zero. Why, first of all, this is called generalized birthday attack? Because if I set L equal to one, I have only two elements. So x0 plus x1 equal to zero. And this is exactly what is a hash collision, uh, the birthday attack, no? So it goes with the square root of the size of the field in which we are working on. Um, but in uh, for more large sizes um, and more in general, it goes sub exponentially in p and the size of uh, of these lists l. And how would I apply this attack into our problem? In the following way, I would take many possible partial trivial solutions. So the diagonal matrix with ones, diagonal matrix with two, and so on and so forth. And I would fill lists with these numbers, with these, uh, with these hash, the hashes of all these, uh, these rows, no? Which would be what I choose here. And then I would um, fix the last row of the matrix to be the row with all ones. Wagner would allow me to find elements, row zero, row one, row two, et cetera such that their sum is equal to this particular value, the hash of the row with all ones. So in a way, Wagner is constraining the last row of the matrix and it's saying, now let's find among all the tri partial trivial solutions, the one for which this linear combination works. But there is nothing and really nothing that prevents me from choosing instead of the row with all ones, for instance, the row that uh, are like, instead of selecting all of these coefficients, just selecting some of them. So introducing some zeros over here. There's really nothing that prevents me from doing it or even more complex linear combinations. And this sort of a 
one of the intuition that made us think there is perhaps more to this. And in particular, if you were to take only a subset of these um, elements, you would end up with something that in cryptography we call the subset sum problem, which is a, a hard problem in some cases. Um, but because we can really choose any linear combination, we can translate this problem in a subset sum problem. And uh, this is sort of uh, perhaps for the more cryptographic audience, um, in a subset sum problem that is based in of powers of two. And we know that for some uh, particular, in some particular cases, the subset sum problem is trivial. And this is one of them. So we're gonna work now, and sort of this is our contribution on um, how to find a non-trivial linear combination that will remap this problem of finding like linear combinations of hash function that still lands in the hash function as a subset sum problem um, of basis of, uh, of powers of two. And we know that in this case, it's easy and we'll see how to do it. So um, now that I sort of try to give the ab abstract intuition of the attack, let's, let's roll back for a second. And again, think about what we are trying to solve. I'm giving the adversary, I'm giving um, part of the problem parameters are P and L. Um, so we're gonna work on a, on a field of sites P and the adversary has to find a matrix um, and a vector. The matrix is of size L plus one times L and the vector is of size L such that the, the product matrix times vector will uh, give us, um, will land in the image of the hash function. Again, the image of what? The hash of each of the rows in the matrix. We also said that there are L that are easy and the only one that is difficult is this last one, row L. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to build for each of these rows, for each J from zero to L, um, a polynomial F that is zero when evaluated in one partial trivial solution, for instance, one and then all zeros, and then zero, one, and then all zeros, et cetera, et cetera. And two to the J when evaluated in two, zero, et cetera, zero, two, et cetera, and so on. So we're essentially selecting two um, valid partial solutions, and then I'm constructing a polynomial by Lagrange interpolation that is either zero or two to the J depending on which vector I'm evaluating it in. So I'm keeping open these two partial solutions at N and I uh, will choose them later, but in, uh, if I evaluate this polynomial into one of them, then I, um, I will obtain zero. Otherwise, two to the J. This polynomial is very easy to find, no? I can uh, really compute it easily and it has degree one. Interpolating over two points, degree one. Um, and all these vectors, no, these hashes, I can pre-compute them, no, they are coefficients. And um, I'm gonna call them, um, I'm gonna index them by one or zero, depending on whether they are the first trivial solution or the second one. Now, this choice of notation is not by chance. This will really be the coefficients that I will choose at the end. So I will end up with the L polynomials, each of them of degree one, that have this property, no? Evaluated in uh, one uh, hash image will give me zero and the other one will give me two to the J. And then I will consider this other polynomial that is just the sum of all these little polynomials. Now this one is uh, a multivariate polynomial in L unknowns that has degree one. Um, why? Because all of these polynomials have degree one and are in the same, uh, um, and, and have all different var if variables as well. So I will end up with uh, all of these coefficients, um, L plus one coefficients and, and possibly like an, a non-constant one with, uh, with L coefficients and possibly a non-constant one. This polynomial has a particular property. Take um, a sufficiently large um, L, if L is big enough, big enough, what does it mean? Uh, that is bigger than uh, log P then I can take any number in the field and I can write it in binary. What does it mean? I take the canonical representative and I write it in binary. Um, now, 
this guy, this term in the summation is either zero or two to the J. What does it mean? That I can write it as the evaluation of my polynomial, the J polynomial in either the hash of the first trivial solution or the second trivial solution, depending on the bit BJ that is given by N itself. I'm summing over all of the FJs here. So I'm summing over all of these polynomials. What does it mean? It means that I am evaluating my sort of big polynomials, big multivariate polynomials in points that are determined by the log of n, by the, by the binary representation of n, by log points that are determined by the binary decomposition of n. Rolling back, any number in the field can be expressed as evaluations of this polynomial row in points that are selected depending on its binary representation. This is sort of the magical property of this polynomial. If this is true for any n in the field, then it's true in particular for this n. I'm taking the hash of all the coefficients of the polynomial itself and shift them by the non-constant term. If I plug this equation here, what do I get? I get that the constant term will cancel out on both sides and I will have the hash of something is equal to the linear combination of the row j with the cj that are selected depending on the binary decomposition of, of uh, this number itself. This is exactly what we wanted. This is the inner product between a vector and a set of coefficients. This is a non-trivial ROS solutions, uh, ROS solution. This is really what we wanted. So how does the attack work? It works as follows. I will pick two different sets of trivial solutions. Why do I need to pick two of them? Because I need their hash to be different. Otherwise, interpolation won't work. Then I will pick, um, I will hash them and um, assign to the J solution left or right, the coefficient CJ left or right that I'm indicating with the bit B. Then I will compute all these little polynomials FJ again, that are zero when evaluated in CJ zero and two to the J when evaluated in CJ one. I will add them up and I will end up with a larger polynomial row multivariate in L unknowns that has degree one again, and it has that particular property. Once I compute this polynomial, I will decompose in binary its coefficients and uh, study, actually not its coefficients, but I, the hash of its coefficients shifted by the constant term. And I will uh, sort of store these bits over here. Now I have a non-trivial solution. So the L plus one one that is um, uh, given by the coefficients of the polynomial itself minus the constant term. And I will have easy ones that are given by um, the trivial solutions, but selected depending on the bits of the of this, uh, the, this guy itself, the, the guy that I'm hashing and shifting itself. So there we go. We have L plus one solutions that uh, satisfy this relation. Matrix times vector is equal to hash image of the rows of the matrix. Now, why do we need this constraint? I said at the beginning of the attack that we needed um, n L to be large enough, L to be bigger than log n. Why do we need it? We need it because when we are decomposing this number in binary, and remember this number is determined by the choice of the, by hash images. So it's gonna be random. Um, so it's going to be distributed uniformly in the field. And therefore all the bits are probably be going to be set or at least uh, the most significant bits are probably going to be set. And, uh, and this is the reason why we need these, uh, uh, these additional constraint, because when we try to express N as a binary number, we need all the bits to be possibly set to one. But in the paper, we actually are able to use, to combine our attack with Wagner's attack and use Wagner's attack in order to fix the leading bits to be zero like sort of 
in the sort of most significant part is going to be set to zero and then use our attack for the least significant bits. Once the first bit are set to zero, then we don't need L to be that large. And therefore we can um, immediately try to, we, we can run the attack on, um, on lower Ls. To give you an idea of the complexity of this attack, um, the attack cost in white, uh, so we I, I put a diagram with the, how L is big. L at the end of the day is going to be the number of parallel sessions that will be open in order to run the attack. And that we will see this in a second. Um, and, and I'm also plotting the number of operations required in order to run the attack. In white, you can see Wagner, and you can see that this scales with the powers of two, and it goes in these like sort of little echelons. And then you see like in this uh, sort of rainbow color, um, our, um, our attack that goes down much faster. And uh, for it is polynomial for um, n larger than log p, uh, for l larger than log p. And it's going to be sub-exponential because we are mixing it with Wagner uh, for lower sizes. But it's going to go down much faster than using Wagner alone. Okay, so um, could you yeah. go back to this plot? So as as L increases, the, the cost of the attack decreases. Yeah, because I will have more choice on how to build the linear combination intuitively. Um, I want to find a linear combination of hash images that lands in the hash image, and if I have more choice for how to pick. If I have a larger linear combination to build on, then it's easier to find um, it's easier to find possibly like this collision. And if we go back to Wagner, even this is immediate, no? Because if L becomes bigger, this guy goes down much faster. The best that I can hope for is L equal to one, in which case I get this nice square root of P. How should we think of L as like two to the sum security parameter? No, L, uh, you should think of P as the security parameter <clears throat> and L as the number of parallel sessions that are handled at once. Imagine like you will have at some point, and, and maybe I'll explain this more in a second, but imagine you will have, um, you're having a server and the server has like L parallel sessions, L is that. So think of well, L, L is really like just a parameter in the in in the attack right now. It is not at all related with the security parameter, but later we will see that it's really tied to how many sessions in parallel the attacker is allowed. Okay, so um, sort of the trivial attack uh, that we can build on is on blind signatures. And um, um, blind signatures um, are protocols where um, have a signer and a user. The user wants to get a signed message on M without revealing the message. The server wants to sign the message without revealing the signing key. So we have this two-party protocol where one holds the signing key, one holds the message, and they want to build a signed message and give it to the user without revealing on each side no information about the signing key and no information about the message. These have been used they were, these were, were proposed like in the 80s by David Chom, and they were proposed initially for like e-voting. Imagine like I have my ballot, I want to go to the office, I want to have a stamp that is saying like this vote is valid without the person actually seeing the vote. And I want them to put it in a, um, 
in a bucket with all of the other votes. And, um, and then I want them to be counted and verified. But I don't want at any point that my vote in order to be signed and validated is, uh, is being revealed to the, to the signer. And at the same time, the signer doesn't want votes to be forged. So um, e-voting was the sort of initial use case for, uh, for this, um, this kind of techniques, for this kind of, uh, of, of primitives. And there are two properties of security here, right? There is unforgeability, which is uh, protecting the signer. And it's saying that even if you interact L times with this uh, signer, at the end, you won't be able to produce L plus one signatures. The L here is not by chance. And uh, generally in cryptography, we have uh, the notion standard for signature is that you cannot produce a signature on an arbitrary message. But in this case, we cannot do it, right? Because we don't know what are the messages. So we have this notion of one more unforgeability in order to say, you cannot do more than I allowed you to do. The second property, and it's the one protecting the user is blindness. And it is saying that it is, uh, the user is not revealing any information about the message. But in our case, our attack is going to go against unforgeability. So I won't care and I won't go in detail in, into details about blindness itself. Short blind signatures are a bit of a mess. I'm going to simplify them. Why? Because the user code, we don't care to look at it. So um, in a short blind signature, and this is really a template that you will see all over the place. This is a template for what is called Sigma protocols. You have a signing key that I'm going to call X in the field and, um, and sort of a, um, that is a sort of in a group G of size P generated by a generator G. I'm using additive notation here. And you will have a user that has a message, a set of bits. What the signer is going to do is uh, build a commitment. So a random element in the P and give the respective element in the group. So this G to the power of K to the user. The user will pick a random challenge. Uh, specifically, we'll do the hash of the commitment with the message. And then um, the server will be there a response on it given by the linear combination of challenge times signing key plus the commitment and give these R to the user. The user will check this equation, but in the group. So has the generator, has the public key, the verification key and K, and can check also that the challenge has been computed correctly. Now note that this protocol is maybe leaking information about the message, why? Because if the message is only zero or one, then it is easy for the signer to guess which message it was. So this protocol is not secure for the user, but the code of the signer is always the same. And uh, if the user is an adversary, we really shouldn't care about what the user is doing. Now, oh, one, another thing to note about this protocol is that the signer has two messages, no? Um, it is uh, 1.5 rounds. Um, I have to send a commitment. I have to hold in mind my session state, and then I have to send a response. In particular, when I have to formalize its security and to say, what does it mean unforgeability again? That after interacting L times with the server, I can produce L plus one forgeries. When I'm interacting with the server, it means that I have access to two different oracles, one for the commitment and one for the response. And they sort of have to keep track which, which sessions I'm in. And again, in a real world scenario, I have to take into account that the adversary might decide to give responses to obtain the responses after looking at all of the commitments. And this is really the case of our attack. And so how does the attack work in, um, in this case? And really this attack was already discovered by Schnorr and that's why we had this assumption. Um, so the adversary will start L parallel sessions with the signer and uh, will obtain L commitments, K, no? It's uh, at this phase, it's stopping here the, after the first message. It's not even computing C yet. It stops and thinks, okay? So 
it starts L parallel sessions, obtains all of these commitments, and then it runs internally the ROS attack that we built before. It uses as a black box and it obtains what? It obtains, um, it runs it for P, the, the size of the group in which I'm working on, and L, the number of open sessions. And it will obtain a bunch of vectors, L plus one of them, and one of size, and a set of coefficients of size L, such that the inner product of rho and C is equal to the hash of the vector of the row itself. But we don't have this hash function at disposal. We are not hashing into vectors. So what I'm going to remap this hash function to is the linear combination of the commitments. I'm taking row and I'm taking what is called a multiscalar multiplication of these, uh, of these group elements. So when I run this, uh, this ROI, try to solve this ROS problem, I will remap the hash function to reply for any query to the vector to this linear combination for any arbitrary message M that I want. Then I will reply with the coefficient C that I got from the attack and I will obtain a bunch of responses, L of them again. So again, the adversary starts L sessions, needs to output L plus one forgeries. So far the adversary opened L sessions and after looking at all of the commitments, decided how to respond with these challenges and then obtain L responses. And now it's going to build L plus one forgeries in the following way. The commitment of the ith forgery is going to be the linear combination of the ith vector. And why look that what is written here is exactly what is in the left-hand side of the hash function what will be indeed the hash of the ith commitment. C and R are the same. They are just the linear combination of the commitments that have the challenges and the responses, the C and the R that they got so far with the ith vector row. Why this is a valid signature? Because if I take the response and I write it as, as, as I defined it, then I end up with the linear combination of the RJ. But the RJ, because the protocol is correct, already satisfied the initial verification equation. So they can be written as I wrote in the previous slide, CJX plus KJ. And by distributivity of the product, I can uh, put rho J, C, I have the linear combination of rho IJ, CJ, which is CI star, and uh, rho IJ, KJ, which is KI star. And note, in addition, that ki star is exactly what goes in the hash function with the message. So um, the message are really something arbitrary. So the forgeries are really for whatever message you want. But I, the signature at the end is valid because not only this equation is satisfied, but also the hash of the commitment and the message is equal to the challenge C, which is, again, the inner product rho ijcj that you see on the left-hand side. So this is the attack on blind strong signatures and how practical is it? Well, once we published the paper, people were asking um, how much would it cost to run? And um, it's pretty bad. Like if we took, take, like this is the code for both server attacker and uh, it really runs in a couple seconds and this is a Python sage. So I would expect it to be even faster on uh, uh, when written in another language. And um, and it's on the elliptic curve that is uh, used by, by Bitcoin. So. Um, this is a real attack that can be like implemented pretty fast. And uh, it's only about defining um, these polynomials that you see here, they are, they are defined manually by interpolation. And then like um, um, decomposing in binary um, the, the, its coefficients, it's, it's really fast. So I guess the bottom line of this talk is that Schnorrblind signature are really not suitable for like uh, practical applications where you have multiple concurrent sessions this is like really the problem is this L. If L gets big, then it's bad. But if you restrain L to be small, then you're opening yourself up to those attacks. So um, I guess the bottom line is really do not use them in practice unless like in some specific scenarios, maybe you have a USB key and uh, you want to run a Schnorrblind signature on that. 
But in cases where you have in the internet, really, this is not suitable. Um, we still have other blind signatures in the game. Blind RSA, it's sort of vintage and uh, post-quantum resistant, cross-quantum private. Yeah, it's information theoretically blind. And um, we have blind BLS, ABE blind signature, and um, enclosure or blind signature, or more recently in a work of Tessaro and others, uh, weighted ROA, uh, like another class of general signatures that are secure um, against even like advers uh, adversary that can run multiple parallel concurrent sessions. Um, yeah, so this is it. I'm happy to take questions if you have any or go into more details about any of these uh, topics that I touched. So thank you for your... <laughs> Thanks. So this new white ROS problem, is it clear that there is no risk that it gets attacked later? Uh... No, they really had a reduction to like, it's, they have a, like a reduction that is information theoretic to with exponential security. Oh, okay. And uh, it is, uh, the verification is different from Schnorr. So whereas here I have, um, the verification equation is the usual one. When usual one, I mean, is the same that you would have in a Schnorr signatures. It's the same between Schnorr blind signatures and Schnorr signatures. In um, um, in their case, it's RG. Oops. Um, can I change the color? Yes. Um, they end up with something of this form: C times Y times X plus K. And that this Y is chosen uniformly at random and fresh every session. What makes the problem hard now is that when you're building this uh, ROS problem, you have this Y that goes along and that is random and fresh every time and that I'm revealing only at the end, only in the response. So again, in the response, I will have this Y in addition here. And, um, and so, um, it is much more difficult to, to solve it. And in particular, they prove that it's information theoretic. Uh, 